Okay. Hi everyone. So today we start the lecture six about trick of the trade. So you should have the, the slides. Everyone I got the slides. Can I start? Can you tell me hello? Okay. Um, I'm very happy to see you again. Uh, just to let you know some uh, information, uh, there are a talk organized uh, speaker is uh, Kerry Mengerson give a nice talk uh, at six for the AMZ course. Uh, and uh, I in charge to introduce uh, uh, Kerry Mengerson for a talk. So I cannot be late to the to the talk, which start at six, and uh, where I need to connect before and so on. So if you have some question, we we'll get more of the question for tomorrow. We have also a second lecture tomorrow. Okay, so I will leave at fifty. Five fifty. I'm I'm going. Okay. Sorry for this, and I uh, I suggest you to attend the, the lecture of Kerry. It will be a nice lecture. You should have received uh, the link of uh, the lecture. All good? We can start. Everybody can hear me well? Sounds good. OK. OK, so today. Oh, 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 it's been my, OK. So the outline of lectures in two hours. We should go through the hyperparameters or to deal with all these number of hyperparameters. And I will introduce a way to do it, which is a Bayesian optimization. This is quite a nice uh, way to uh, calibrate your tuning parameter. We talk about transfer learning. You need to talk a little bit about transfer learning already yesterday. We talk about data augmentation and also what uh, happens when you have uh, you are faced to unbalanced uh, case. So, so meaning that you have uh, some uh, class of uh, when you do class a multi a multi class uh, task, you have one class which is uh, under representing, and so how to deal with this kind of uh, problem. So okay, so you will see that. Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry for this. So we have seen in the in different uh, track and different lectures that the performance of the deep learning is depending on meta parameters. So the meta parameters we call it hyperparameters, and these tuning parameters are tuned by by us. So how to choose this hyperparameter, which has not been learned through the process. So the hyperparameters we have seen is crucial for defining your model and to control the success of your training process. So we have two kinds of hyperparameters, some family or hyperparameter. So we have the optimizer hyperparameters, and which is all the hyperparameters for controlling your, your, your process or for your optimization process. And after you have the hyperparameter, which is more specific for the model specification. So we see the different kind of heuristic to choose this uh, hyperparameter. So first, the parameter related to the architecture of your model. So today on the part, you have seen that uh, some student ask uh, how many layers to put, which kind of layer, and so on. So the number of uh, hidden units, which uh, so I just list here the, the parameters, which is hyperparameter, which has already to the architecture of your model. So you have the number of hidden units, the number of layers, and the kind of activation function. So the number of hidden unit is uh, gives the capacity of your model to learn your function. And you have seen also 
uh, in the lecture, I told you that we add some hydrogen layer. Remember that we need four uh, units, uh, four neurons to represent any multiplication of two features. Okay, and we have seen that to do something uh, to to go deeper and deeper. In fact, you can explore a model which is more complex. So, and after you have to choose also the activation function. So I have put some question, but easy question for you as the quiz two. Okay, classification task, which uh, activation, activation function we use? You don't want easy question. Okay, I will ask a hard question. Okay, everybody left or what? Where is my shot? Sigmoid. Okay, so the softmax sigmoid. So yes. So the activation function, not for you, Jade. So for classification, if you have a binary classification, we use the sigmoid function. If you have a multi-class uh, classification task, we use the softmax. And for the regression task, we use the identity. So in fact, it's not an activation function. We don't put any, any activation function for the relation task. Okay, now the relu function is one of the most uh, popular function. During the um, tutorial, I had a nice question. Some uh, student told me that uh, ah, the relu and the likely relu are not differentiable uh, a function is true at zero, but as we use a uh, gradient descent uh, optimization uh, flavor, it will not uh, pose any problem that we don't have the, the is not differentiable at zero. Okay, so the value is, is known to be less computational expensive for the tan and the sigmoid, so it's now is more popular, the value and the little value for the hidden uh, layer. But the, uh, we talk uh, during the lecture that the main drawback of the ROLU function. If somebody knows this or not, or not. Yes, Mathieu, is true. Yes, so no negative value is a mean, yes, zero and negative value. So is a meaning as there are zero and negative value. Uh, you can make it's called the uh, dead neuron. So if we're going down, maybe you can have dead neuron, so no, never activation. Okay. So you process that. Some heuristic I found from popular, I don't I think it was a uh, Benji say this. So heuristic one, simple first. A popular heuristic is to incrementally build a more complex model. So always try first by a, a small model with one or two hidden layers. And if your model fails with one or two layers, you increment uh, you increment the number of layers. And the RC2, it was increase the number of neurons first. So before increasing the number of hidden, uh, uh, hidden layer, you increase the number of neurons in the first and two, uh, two layer because it's less computational. So this is heuristic. So first think simple. Okay, so now I will more focus on this part of this lecture on uh, parameter related to the optimization process. So to the optimization process, I have just list some and I will ask you which other uh, hyper parameter we have for the optimization process. So the learning rate, the mini batch size, the number of epochs, the weight decay, and I say and more. Can you give me more you have in mind of kind of hyperparameter? So is a parameter which are not learned from the training data, but is we need to specify 
uh, this hyperparameter to uh, run our, our optimization uh, process. Yes, good, good point. One point for Luc, drop out. <coughs> the point is drop out. Second one. Yes, Mathieu, choose choice of the, the, it could be seen like a, an hyperparameter because it's depending the, the algorithm, algorithm choice, yes. All of these choice is need to be fixed by the user. Another one, I was thinking of something we have seen today. <sighs> The log function, uh, not really, because the log function is really depending of uh, of your task. For example, the log function, you can uh, have different loss function. It's true because you can uh, ad uh, adapt your loss function. But the loss function generally is, is quite uh, is quite uh, uh, clear about which kind of loss function you use. If you have binary class problem, you use the cost entropy. If you have a multi-class problem, you will have use the cost and the for category data. And the most common in regression is to use the, the square loss. I hope I uh, yeah, reply to your question, I don't know. Nobody else for something else? Initial values, yes. The, so the initial value is a weight, is a, yeah, how to uh, initialize your, your weight. So is a meaning you can use, uh, the, you, you know what you need to do something random, but you can use a uniform, you can use a normal and uh, different resting points. Yes. All the data is split into training and validation tests. I wouldn't put too much on the, on the, on the training because uh, in fact, the training, the hyperparameter and the validation uh, All the data is split in training and validation and test. It's quite a hard question to, to ask because, of course, when you do this, is random. But for the training and the validation, but the test is something you have. If you do something, if you want to do, uh, if you have some competition or whatever, you test set, you don't have access to the test set. The test set, you have a look at the test set at the end. But after inside, it's true that you can do different uh, shuffle and so on. But is the is not like a part of the hyperparameter we we will uh, deal with. I was thinking about uh, to put batch normalization or not putting batch normalization. Okay. Uh, okay. So we see how to do this. So now everybody are clear on this, but you have all your data is split in three. The test set, you never use the test set is evaluated to your final model. And you work with the training data, which is training data for the optimization and the validation data are using in fact for choosing the best model by optimizing the hyperparameter. Okay, clear? So one kind of uh, first hyperparameter, we have a great uh, an influence of your learning process is le learning rate. And we have seen that the, with Sarat, but if you have a learning rate low, but you will be green. Sorry for this. Okay, I was there. Okay, calibration of the learning rate. We have seen that if the learning rate is too low, it could be slow going to the, your minimum. Or if it's too high, it will be just like going from one side to the other side. So you need to be, in fact, to, 
to deal with this uh, learning rate. So it's not recommending, in fact, I saw that to use a constant learning rate. And the main approach to fix this is uh, called the exponential decay. So you can see that, in fact, your learning rate will uh, going down. Going down, exponential, yes. Uh, during the number of epoch. So it decreases at each epoch t with this function. And you have this exponential decay or the inverse decay. So this is quite popular to, to this with the learning rate. And or you can also doing the step decay. So it's reducing the learning rate by some factor after each few epochs. So the main app, some, uh, some author uh, proposed to half the running rate every five epochs uh, or to decrease of 0 0.1 after 20 epochs, something like this. So, but keep in mind that it's not so good to, to use the same learning rate during all the optimization process during the epoch. Okay, I'll put the chat here. Somebody asked me a question. Yes, I don't know. So yes, everyone. Jade said yes, but I don't know the, the history, sorry. <laughs> okay. So what we have to deal also is the mini batch. So the mini batch, I remember that mini batch of size one, so it's just one sample is is calling the stochastic training. But we never use this because it's too time consuming and you it's not time consuming, but you will oscillate a lot, uh, a lot of viability. So most of the time we use the uh, mini batch. So it's a batch of, uh, of training and a, post a popular value is 32. And uh, also I saw, I saw some kind of heuristic to choose subsequent values. You can try one, two, and so on. If it's, because one could be fast, but it, we, it will be maybe some oscillation uh, a lot to the learning process. But uh, okay, the main, uh, main point is 32, but you can have this kind of uh, number of, uh, of value. And this is for you, uh, you need that this number of value is depending on this, this Related to the GPU, in fact. Okay, we're still on the track. Okay, number of epoch. We have seen that sometimes it doesn't make so it's good to have a number of epoch, but the main point is that the this kind of graph is very useful to see if you are overfitting your model or not overfitting your model. So now I think at this stage of the course, it's pretty clear what is going on. But if your prediction error is going uh, down and your generation error going up like this, you can see that, that your model start to overfitting uh, around this part. So the idea of early stop is to stop your model to, to train at when your generation error does not improve anymore after a number of epochs. So for example, in Keras, you have this parameter patience, which interrupts your training when the accuracy has stopped to move after uh, training. Okay, uh, okay, I will, I'll read the, um, the question of Jay, Jad. Do you take the sum or the mean of the gradient you get for each of them point. In okay, so uh, okay, then can I can hear you? Give tell me again. Um, I think I think Yoni closed the meeting accidentally. Twice. Yes. <laughs> Come on, Yoni. Is he? Is still here? No, he closes it when he leaves. He comes in to see if everything is okay, and then he leaves the meeting and he presses end the meeting. Because it automatically makes him the host when he joins. Oh and my! When he God. leaves, he okay. closes it. If if this happen again, I will call him, and I will. Okay, we are uh, recording. I cannot say anything bad to Yoni because Yoni is my friend. He's a nice guy. <laughs> but now I'm coming to be upset now. Huh? Okay. 
I hope you don't want to join again. The meet the video. Okay, we keep going. Every so everyone was disconnected. Is it? I think we're all back now. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Twenty six person. Okay, my God. It's killing me. Okay, back. Okay. I was thinking I'm doing something bad with my computer. So we were okay. So every everybody is clear for the early stop. What is the meaning of the early stop? I think everybody got the early stop. Okay, we have another uh, tuning parameter, which is the tuning parameter on this process, which is L two regularization. Do you remember? Do you remember this approach when you have a loss function? And we add a penalty, which is at this stage is the norm two of the weight, and you have a parameter on the uh, and hyperparameter, which is called lambda here, which is a weight regularization hyperparameter. And this uh, parameter is also an hyperparameter, which uh, help us, which is called the weight decay, because it, in fact, it shrinks a little bit your, your weight. And so it forces, in fact, you have a, a way to, to prevent for overfitting. It's because it controls, in fact, the contribution of each weight with the, the penalty. So it's really depending of lambda, because if you put lambda equal to zero, you don't have penalty. But if you put lambda uh, a huge value, it will put all your value to zero. So it's something between zero and a huge value. So all to fix this hyperparameter too. So the, the recommendation, the suggestion is to first to, to try small values. So small values that is controlling the contribution, but if you put very small value, is it does shrink too much the coefficient. But if you have some overfitting, we should uh, um, put a larger value for lambda. Okay, so some, uh, so which value exactly to, to use? Uh, as it's, it will be too uh, time consuming to do a grid search for all the value is, uh, is uh, reasonable to use the same weight decay for all layers. Because you have this regulation term, you can do after each layer if you want. But don't use uh, different hyperparameter for each layer. And we don't change the value during the process. So we say that the, for the learning weight, we change the learning weight during each uh, during. Uh, the process, so during the, the, the epochs, but not for the this hyperparameter. So most of the time we can use a kind of a grid search, uh, grid search strategy to, to choose uh, which hyperparameter is, a, is a more appropriate uh, for your learning process. Okay. So from experiment, uh, colleagues have shown that uh, smaller data set and architecture seems to require larger value for weight decay. But for larger data set and deep architecture, we need smaller value. What is the meaning is this, the intuition on this is when you have large data set, you will not be faced at too much overfitting. So if you don't have a lot of uh, a huge data set, in fact, as you don't have tr trouble of overfitting, you don't need to have a, a huge value of this penalty term because a huge value is to prevent overfitting. So this is kind of intuition of this result. Okay. So now you have seen we have a lot of hyperparameter for uh, the optimization procedure. So I just say learning rate, mini batch, uh, number of epoch, weight decay, and more. So 
there are three main techniques to, for finding these optimal values. The more natural one is the grid search. And after we have the random search and the most sophisticated, but the more powerful is the Bayesian optimization. So the two popular from uh, this, and you have an illustration, this session is from this paper. So is a, uh, is a grid search. So what is the meaning of the grid search? Is I just put in the case when you have uh, two uh, hyperparameter to to tune. So you put a grid search and you, you put a grid and you need to evaluate your model, not to evaluate, to do your model for each of the combination. And you can imagine that as we have a lot of hyperparameter, so you have a multi grid search and it will be that uh, the complexity is exponential with the number of hyperparameters. So it's impossible to do a grid search if you have a lot of hyperparameters. So it's depending on the neural network. And all the proposed uh, Benjo and uh, colleagues propose a random uh, search. So instead to do all of this uh, combination, you just randomly choose some combination. And it looks like that gives this more uh, efficiency for for finding it for tuning the, the hyperparameter the good news from all of these uh, these two procedures is that it's easy to to parallelize you can understand that you can uh, if you have a multi-core big server you can run for each set of uh, hyperparameter your process in different uh, core or different process make sense so a new, but not a new, it's quite a new, a, but uh, it's not new, <laughs> it's a Bayesian optimization. So now is, uh, is widely used, is uh, the Bayes, Bayesian optimization technique. So you have seen on the lecture, I hope you, you read the lecture before, and I will just give you the intuition, not in details, how the Bayesian optimization is working. Um, so the main idea of the, to use a Bayesian uh, framework is to use the, to pay attention to the past result to decide which combination of hyperparameter I will choose. So in fact, in the random in the random layer layout, you put at different place, but in fact, the idea of the optimization is maybe give some uh, information or where is more likely to have uh, 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 the best uh, hyperparameter combination. So maybe it will be in this area. And this will be given by using a Bayesian framework. So this is the idea. So now with my notation is think that you want to to find the hyperparameter which is in theta and theta represent all the hyperparameter okay so our cost function is still a function which we want to minimize is in the function of w and uh, b which is the weight and the bias so this is a parameter which will be uh, estimated by our optimization process. But this is, we have uh, each estimation for depending of this hyperparameter, okay? So we have the cost function, which is depending on the setting of hyperparameter, and we want to estimate is this. Okay, but now we want to choose the best hyperparameter. So now we have a new 
function, which is not the new function, is a cost function, but my function is on theta. Okay, and I want to find the best theta, which gives us this uh, function the smallest as possible. Okay, so more formally, I consider a function f from uh, from a compact in Rd bounding domain to R. So what we want to solve is to find put x star, which minimize, which is our main of this function. So keep in mind now with the notation that this x is a configuration of hyperparameter. And in fact, this function is computing from on the error on the validation set because we want to find the combination configuration of hyperparameter, which give us the error on validation set the smallest as possible. But we have been seen that for a combination of hyperparameter, this function is very uh, expensive to, uh, to evaluate. Is the reason that we cannot do a grid search or a random search. Any question at this stage? Does this make sense? So maybe with uh, something in action, we'll be okay. So just to, to represent uh, something simple, you have this function, f, is here on the y-axis, and r on the x-axis is, think about this like uh, in uh, one dimension because it's easy to visualize is your hyperparameter you, you want to optimize. Make sense? So I have four starting points. So it's a meaning that is four hyperparameter. I can uh, build my, uh, I can compute my, um, the error on the validation, uh, the quality of the model on the validation set. But it's quite expensive. So now is where to, to explore, where is the minimum? So I asked you where to, to, to decide to, to, to choose another point. Yes, so we can see that some people say, ah, maybe, yeah. but maybe the function is like this, you know? But maybe it's true, it's like this. So it's very hard. So everyone have a guess. So if I ask this, ah, yeah, maybe you have a decision that is around there, but maybe it's completely uh, in other part, okay? So, this is to the, the idea is to build a probability model to have a good guess. So this probability model is a surrogate, we call it surrogate model, which is kind of proxy, which is uh, less uh, uh, computational uh, demanding that to compute each time f. So the idea is to this surrogate model, the, the most, uh, uh, popular model now is to use the framework of Gaussian process. And we see why. And with Gaussian process in the Bayesian framework, you will combine a prior and the likelihood to get a posterior. And this posterior will be measured for given some observation. So given some observation, you will combine the prior and the likelihood. And so you have the posterior which give help us to decide where to sample. And to decide where to sample, it will be according, which I put in red, at the acquisition function. Acquisition function. That's the idea. Okay. The Gaussian process. I will let you 
read again this for tomorrow if you want more details, but I cannot go through all the Gaussian process. But the Gaussian process is a surrogate model which we allow, uh, allow to predict f. We don't have f because it's too expensive, so we will predict f. And the Gaussian process is very nice too because it is enable us to quantify uh, our uncertainty in the prediction using a, a probability probability distribution. And so it's based on the uh, multivariate normal distribution. So I, I put the, um, the definition of the Gaussian process there and you have in the lecture. I can reply to some question tomorrow if you want, if you go to the Gaussian process. And there are different kernel function in the Gaussian process will give you the the, the covariance between uh, some data points. So, so why is useful the Gaussian process? Is because our goal is to make the prediction about the function value at a new point. Because some, some people tell me 0 0.6, 0 0.5. So I want to get a prediction of any new point, possible new point. And the Gaussian process give us the distribution. You have this property that thanks to uh, this property of the Gaussian process, we know that a new uh, function value, which is F star, which is a function at the new point X star, is jointly normally distributed with all the, uh, the observation, observation value from the observed data. And this is useful because we can derive the prediction, the probability that to get F star given F. So we will get the distribution of any new point X star by modelizing with a Gaussian process. So I give you this. Uh, like a, a visual, but I prefer to go directly to, to play. I think I put a link here. If you click, uh, let's play with Russian. I don't know where is the link. Yes, open. Oh, good. So you have this link of the tutorial. I suggest you to, to click on and you have the, the link. Where is the link? Ah, this is a nice tutorial, but I, I don't want to show this you, you this. Okay. Yes. So this, I, I suggest you to look at this tutorial, but I want also to go, not this link. Uh, yeah. If you click on here, here, I just you to just give you the intuition of the Gaussian process to play. Okay. So you don't have a data point. You don't have point, okay? But I decide to put up one point here. So the Gaussian process, it try to have like a, you can see this as a, a Gaussian regression, a flexible Gaussian regression a, with uncertainty. So when you add a new data, it will try to fit your data and it gives you the uh, uncertainty. So as soon as you have a new data, okay, I say, oh, maybe the air, it gives you this. Okay. I'm stressed because I have still a, a lot of time, but it's okay, it's better to. So keep in mind that the Gaussian process are probability distribution over function and is using the maximum likelihood, you can uh, get some intuition. So back to our example, where will you try next? If to get your intuition, the Gaussian process is this is an estimation from your Gaussian process, but the mean is one sample. So each time it gives you a curve, one sample. And there you have the minimum, the histogram of the minimum. So the minimum is here. But if you have a, an over guess, I put three over, 
you have this is also with these four points for uh, function sample from your Gaussian process. Okay, makes sense. That means that doesn't make sense. And I keep going. Another, another, and at the end, I have sample plenty, and so I have the distribution. The distribution of the minimum on the on the bottom. You can see the distribution of the of the minimum. On all the function, but you can see that some viability. Okay, so this Gaussian process will help us to decide where to draw a new sample, a new data point. So as it's, it's a bit ugly like this, the author put some uh, with some uh, prediction interval. So this is the mean. Of your estimation of the Gaussian process, and after you have the uncertainty on your estimation. You have a huge uncertainty because you have just four data points, and at the bottom you have the distribution of the minimum. So maybe somebody. So now we, when you have this, where you want to explore the next one? Okay. 0 0.7 because the minimum is the thing is there. Okay. But okay, and this 0 0.7, but you can see that there are huge variability also here. So maybe it's there. Okay. So instead of looking at all with so how to choose the next point is based on the acquisition function. So is the acquisition function, the idea is to indicate or promising a new candidate where to explore. And all, all to explore is a balance of exploration and exploitation. Explore, exploitation. So the exploration is to evaluate, to evaluate in place where the variance is large, because if it's large, it could be there. And exploitation is to evaluate in place where the mean is low. So it's a trade-off between these two, exploration, exploitation. So we will build an acquisition function and from this acquisition function, we will explore a new candidate. We will draw a new candidate. That's the way of the optimization process. So the procedure is to evaluate all the candidates. So you do for all the candidates, you compute an acquisition function and from this acquisition function, you will rank all the candidates and you will pick the best one. The best one based on the acquisition function. And the acquisition function, keep in mind, is the trade off between the exploration and exploitation, low mean, high variance. So there are different kinds of acquisition function which can be used and have been exploited is all of this and i just present one here in the course which is expected improvement which is the most popular one so this if you're looking at this expectation expected improvement I'll, I'll leave you a little bit some time just to read it clearly what it is is the expectation of the max of the difference of f theta hat, which is a current optimal set of hyperparameters, so the smallest, and the difference with all the uh, possibility. So if the new value is much better, you will win bit a lot. If it's worse, we haven't lost anything. So we will compute the expedition improvement for all. And in fact, based on the Gaussian process, there are an explicit formula for the expected improvement. And they involve the mean of the Gaussian process and also the standard deviation, 
so the uncertainty of the uh, Gaussian process, so the exploration and the uh, exploitation. So what is happening here? So an example here, and after we stop. So I have just one point here. So this is a mean, this is a true in dash, but you don't have this one. So you have the current best, and this is compute the expectation. So the second point is I've been chosen there. So this is a new data point. So you fit a new Gaussian process on this with the mean and standard deviation. And you have the expected, so the, the next one from this uh, plot, you will choose which one which maximize this one. So which maximize this one, it was at this stage there, it was the maximum. So you decide to explore at this point. So at this point, you will have a new value for your model. So you here. And from this, you have a new Gaussian process, a mean and uh, uh, some uncertainty. So you can compute the expected improvement. And you have this value. And so the best is there. So you decide to explore at this point. Explore at this point, you get this value. The Gaussian process change, and so on and so on. You get it? And so on, and you start to go to the true one. Up, and you draw there. Up, and you draw there. And at and one stage, you stop here. And you get the minimum. OK, I have been a little bit fast. But did you get the intuition of the optimization uh, optimization, Bayesian optimization to decide where to explore. Okay, thanks, Jade. I'm sorry, I think I was bad on this explanation. So the main step to summary, to summary, function f is very expensive. So we have a surrogate model, which is cheaper to evaluate. Surrogate model is based on the Gaussian process. The Gaussian process, y, is a Bayesian framework. We give you some, uh, uh, some uncertainty about your um, your function, and we will help you to decide where to draw a new uh, data point. And this is based on uh, acquisition function, and you choose your new data point based on the maximum of the acquisition function, which is a trade-off between exploration and exploitation, and you compute the new data point, new point, and so on and so on, and you wait here. I'm really sorry. Okay, one question. Conclusion, conclusion, conclusion. Conclusion first. Empirical Bayesian optimization has been demonstrated a good, better result using fewer experiments compared with research and random research. I list here, in fact, on the PDF, there are some link. You, you can click on each uh, tutorial on Bayesian optimization. If you click it, you have a nice uh, web page, tutorial of Bayesian optimization in R. Some people in R. You have a video from Javier Gonzalez, which explain better than me this optimization uh, process, but he, he explained me this in, I think, half an hour or 45 minutes, okay? So I, I suggest you, if you have some time, to uh, watch this video. It's quite nice, very nice, very nice uh, explanation. And there are some R package we can do uh, in, uh, to, to draw some Gaussian process and how to fit some Gaussian process. Thanks a lot. Uh, sorry for Yoni. And uh, I hope uh, to see you at, uh, at the conference. How many people are still there? 24, okay. We lost a little bit some people. And I see you when when I see you tomorrow four, is it? Two more four. Okay. I hope I wasn't a bit clear with I was a bit stress. Okay. Okay. So guys. I will close away. I'm late.
for two five minutes. Good. So yeah, bye. Thanks, thanks.